The Takuma 50 F1.4 is one of the great fast 50s of the film era. It was made by the Ashahi Optical Company of Japan from 1959 to 1968. It was designed to compete head-on with the leading German fast 50s, and it did this very successfully. These Takumas are beautifully engineered, with all metal bodies and some of the smoothest focus actions of any lenses ever made. The glass and coatings are very good, they really are a joy to use. Coupled with the excellent Pentax Spotmatic SLR camera, the Takuma 50 f1.4 was a bestseller around the world for many years, recognized as a high quality lens by both amateur and professional photographers alike. It was used by famous fashion and portrait photographers like David Bailey and celebrities including the Beatles. Today the lens still performs very well on the largest digital sensors, producing sharp and colourful images stop down and lovely dreamy bokeh shots wide open. It's not as sharp or HD resolving as the high-end expensive Fast 50s produced today, but it has its own distinctive charm. Take this photo, for example, of some flowers growing by our high street. Stop down, the lens has rendered the whole scene quite well, but it's very cluttered and not that pleasing on the eye. It's a bit headache inducing, quite frankly. However, wide open, the lens has, in my opinion, applied some magic to the whole composition, producing the most beautiful, creamy, smooth background from the cluttered city scene. And bokeh is one of the special things about the Takuma 50 f1.4, smoother and more painterly than many other fast 50s, old and new. I have friends who own Leicas and top of the range Canons and Nikons and other cameras, and this is often the only Takuma or even Pentax lens they've all heard of and all know about. It justifiably has a legendary status in the photographic world, and it's highly rated in best of reviews of film era lenses. There are in fact four main versions of the Takuma 50 f1.4. The earliest eight elements version called the Super Takuma, a second version of the Super Takuma that had seven elements, and some of these lenses are radioactive. Then the Super Multi-Coated Takuma with seven elements. This lens definitely is radioactive. And finally, the SMC Takuma with seven elements and a redesigned focus ring. Let's look at the different versions in more detail, starting with the early eight elements version of the Super Takuma. This lens was produced between 1964 and 1966. It has eight elements in six groups and it has six aperture blades. So what's all the fuss about the eight element version versus the seven element version? Well, first of all, apparently it was an expensive lens to produce with very high quality parts and standards. It's a lens that would cost an arm and a leg to make today. It also has a rarity factor. Fewer eight element versions were made and they've developed a kind of cult status. And in terms of image quality, there's a view amongst owners that the 8-element version produces more magical images, images with more of that elusive pixie dust, especially when you use this lens wide open. This is a view I tend to agree with. The 8-element version really does produce the most magical, dreamy bokeh wide open. The next question people ask is how can you tell an 8-element version from a 7-element version, considering they both have the same name? They're both called Super Takumas. Well, there are some simple clues to spotting the earlier version, starting with the serial number. Typically, it will be lower than around 1,400,000. This one in my hand is a very early and rare version with a very low serial number under 1 million. But the serial number alone isn't a guaranteed way of spotting the 8 elements version, especially amongst the higher serial numbers. What is guaranteed is that this little red infrared line here on the 8 elements version is on the right-hand side of the number 4 line. This really early version has another quirk. It has an R at the base of the line. The vast majority of lenses have the red line, but not the R. On a 7-element version, the red line is on the left-hand side of the 4. The position of this line is a pretty foolproof way of telling between the two. You can also tell whether it's an 8-element version by looking at the rear element. If it curves out more from the metal casing, then it's an 8-element version. If it's flatter and more encased in the metal, then it's a 7-element version. It's hard to see here, but it does make a difference. And on some DSLRs, the rear element can hit the camera's mirror. You need to check your DSLR's compatibility before buying one of these lenses. So why did Asahi change the design from 8 to 7 elements? Rumour has it that the 8-element version was so expensive to manufacture 
that each lens was sold at a loss, and the company decided to simplify the design down to seven elements. Not sure that's correct, but the fact is that the lens was selling very well, and the company probably needed to simplify and speed up the production process anyway. In reality, the seven-element version of the Super Tacomas are excellent lenses too. Now on to the Super Multicoated Tacoma. This lens was made between 1971 and 1972. It has eight blades compared to the six blades of the earlier Super Tacomas, and it has seven elements arranged into six groups. It may have lost an element, but it's still a great lens. In fact, stop down, I'd say it's a better lens than the earlier versions, and those extra blades help too. A key feature of this version of the lens is that it has radioactive thorium glass. It's not a coating, it's the glass itself, and over time, as the radioactive material ages, it turns a sort of golden browny yellow. Now, if you own one of these lenses and it's turned that color, you have a big decision to make. Do you decolor the lens and return it to the original clear color, or do you leave it as it is? If you leave it yellowed, it'll lose a stop or two because of the darker glass, a little like using a yellowed ND filter, and you'll get some rather lovely golden tones to your images. For this particular lens, I decided to de-yellow the glass because I wanted to use it as it was originally designed and at the fastest possible speed. It was an easy thing to do. I used a lamp from IKEA. It has to be a specific model. And I left both ends of the lens under the lamp for a couple of days. It worked perfectly. You can also de-yellow the lens by leaving it in the sunshine for a week or two. But I found the lamp far easier. Radioactive glass was used by a number of different lens makers in Japan, in Europe and in America. They found that radioactive glass was a superior way of reducing flares and increasing contrast compared to coating the glass, although these lenses also have multi-coatings on top of the glass. The manufacture of radioactive glass was soon stopped, and from what I've read on the internet, these lenses are not dangerous or harmful to use unless you grind up and eat the glass or sleep with the glass which is not something many of us are planning to do, despite our love for these lenses. The last 50 f1.4 that Takuma made for the M42 mount was this SMC version. It was produced between 1972 and 1975, and it has seven elements in six groups with eight aperture blades. The company had been refining their coatings for lenses over the years, to the point where they were recognized as world leaders. And this lens really does have great coatings, with good flare control, good colours and good contrast. On a less positive note, they replaced the metal focus ring of the earlier versions with this hard plastic ring. It's not as tactile to use, although perhaps in tough conditions, in very hot weather or very cold weather, it feels better. But not for me. I think this was a step backwards. So which of these lenses is the best lens, or more specifically, which lens do I recommend? Having used them for decades now, I actually think the answer to this question is quite easy. First of all, the SMC version is a fine lens for its age. It's particularly sharp and colourful stop down, and it has a lovely bokeh wide open. However, it's a little too soft for me wide open when you try to focus in on subjects. I've got an example here, one of many I could show you, with the lens wide open and the lens stopped down to f5.6. At f5.6, it's nice and sharp. At f1.4 on the left, it's not so sharp, and you wouldn't expect it to be so sharp, but it's really not very sharp at all, and it has some ghosting and blurring on the letters as well. Nevertheless, I'd be happy to recommend this lens for all kinds of cameras, DSLRs and mirrorless, especially if you're looking for a good value old Fast 50, perhaps as a walk around or a portrait lens. But to me, it's not quite as unique as the other two. Now, if I was doing this video in the film era, and I was asked to choose just one of these lenses, then I would pick this super multi-coated version. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And I'd make sure it was de-yellowed. If I wanted a yellow effect, I'd use a yellow filter, as indeed I did in the film days. I'd choose this version because of its fabulous rendering stopped down or even partially stopped down. In the film era, I'd seldom use a lens completely wide open. If I wanted a bokeh rich photo, I'd probably stop the lens down a notch or two I've been looking through all my film shots with Fast 50s, and hardly any of them are shot wide open. I'd only use wide open indoors, at home or in a museum, for example, when the light was so poor and I couldn't use a flash. 
This lens produces beautiful bokeh wide open. Maybe not quite as sharp as the 8 elements version wide open, but sharp enough. However, it's stopped down where the radioactive glass is so effective. The lens really does outperform the 8 elements version in terms of rendering, contrast and colours. Now today, in the digital era, if you asked me to choose just one lens to use on a full frame digital camera, it would be the earliest version. And that's because I'm using this digital camera for a lot more experimental and wide open photos. I say experimental because I don't really care how many snaps it takes to get an interesting photo wide open with unique blur effects or flares or unusual background shapes. On a roll of film, with only a limited number of snaps available, I was much, much more careful and I wasn't keen on wide open experimentation. However, on digital, I can really snap away a lot on reusable disk space. So for a powerful digital camera, I'm looking for a high quality lens that produces interesting and unusual results, especially wide open. And it's wide open where this eight element version really shines. Bokeh is a subjective thing, of course, but I think this lens produces the best bokeh of all the lenses here and some of the best bokeh of all vintage Fast 50s. The more limited coatings allow more light and effects in without interference, and the results can be beautifully dreamy and painterly. Yes, it might flare more, but actually, I'm okay with that. I want more interesting effects. In terms of sharpness wide open, as long as I nail the focus, I've never had a problem with sharpness or thought, that's just too soft. So in conclusion, all four versions are excellent lenses considering their age. If you're looking for the best rendering lens stop down, but still with beautiful bokeh, then the super multi-coated version is the best version if you don't mind using a radioactive lens, that is. However, if you're looking for artistic, creative photographs wide open, with wonderfully smooth and painterly bokeh, and an amazing blend of dreamy images that are also sharp on the subjects in focus, then it's the eight element version you should go for, if you can find one. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe if you haven't done so already, and I'll be producing some more videos like this. And any comments below will be most welcome.